Um, now, in Canada, of course, we didn't build bombs. Uh, we, although we participated in the first atomic bomb project with, with the United States and with Britain, and played a, a fairly minor but significant role, um, we really w went after nuclear power. And the idea was to harness the power of the atom for good and to use this tremendous energy uh, not to hurt people but to, to produce something very useful and to help to really improve the world. This is a nuclear power plant under construction in, in Ontario. It's the Darlington Nuclear Power Station. You will notice that cylindrical building in the background. That cylindrical building is not a nuclear reactor. It's what's called a vacuum building. And it's a separate building which is kept under negative pressure so that in the event of an accident, all the fission products and radioactive steam and gases can be sucked into that vacuum building uh, rather than going into the reactor building or rather than going into the environment. Um, this is a rather expensive type of addition to a nuclear power station and they won't be building those in Alberta. They won't be using vacuum buildings because it adds to the cost. They're trying to design reactors which are good reactors but which are much smaller and cheaper to build so that they can get more customers because uh, they really need customers. Um, so. Uh, I just wanted to point that out. The only place where there are these vacuum buildings, all the reactors in Ontario have vacuum buildings, vacuum buildings. None of the reactors anywhere else, even the Candu reactors, none of them have vacuum buildings. Now, uh, during normal operation, there are materials which are released to the environment. Um, and they, of course, find their way into the fish and into the grass and into the cows and into the humans. But uh, generally speaking, these emissions are very, very low in terms of the fission products. So you have minute amounts of fission products that are released in the cooling water and in the air and so on. But there are some types of radioactive materials which are released in much larger quantity. And one of those is tritium, which is a special consideration, a special concern. And another one is carbon-14. These are radioactive forms of hydrogen and carbon. Now, anybody who's had any elementary science knows that hydrogen and carbon are the basis of all organic molecules. If you look in our body, uh, the molecules that make us up are organic molecules. They're carbon-based, and they have hydrogen atoms attached. Well, the, the problem with hydrogen and carbon, which are radioactive, is they behave just like normal hydrogen and carbon. And therefore, they, they first of all, they're given off usually in the form of water. So you have radioactive water. But you can't filter out the radioactivity because you can't separate water from water. You can't filter water out of water. So it just goes everywhere that water goes. And that means in all living things. And it also means that it's extremely mobile. Uh, the good side is that it doesn't tend to be stored up by the body because water is so plentiful that the body eliminates the water as well as you know, you, it goes in, it goes out. Uh, so that, but of course, if there's a perpetual supply of, of tritium, then uh, you are getting it all the time. Uh, also, what happens is that inside the reactor, the levels of tritium tend to build up each year. Each year, there's more tritium than there was the year before because it's added. The half-life of tritium is 13 years. So the tritium that was produced the year before is still around when the next year's tritium is produced. And then that's still around when the next year's tritium is produced. So you end up getting a situation where the releases of tritium tend to grow year after year and the contamination in the environment. It builds up in the environment as well. Same thing goes for carbon-14. Just before coming out here, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, I guess, I was in Ottawa at a one-day conference on the health effects of tritium, uh, sponsored by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Association, uh, and, uh, as, uh, sorry, the Canadian Nuclear Safety uh, Commission. And, uh, all the experts that were there, most of whom are pro-establishment type, you know, pro-nuclear experts, and some of them uh, being on the other side of the fence, being more critical, more independent, uh, some of them maybe even being uh, anti-nuclear, but still very competent people. They all agreed, without exception, that the, the health risks of tritium are at least two or three times larger than was previously thought, and maybe as much as 10 to 20 times more dangerous than previously thought. Now, around in Ontario, all of the drinking water around all of the Candu reactors in Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick 
all of them have elevated levels of tritium in their drinking water. And the levels of tritium in the drinking water uh, around these, in these communities is high enough that it would be illegal if you were living in California. Because in California, they have a standard for tritium in drinking water, which is 15 becquerels per liter. A becquerel, because again, people wonder, what the heck is that? A becquerel means one disintegration per second. That's what a becquerel is. So if you have one disintegration every second, that's one becquerel. 15 becquerels is the maximum allowed for tritium in California. Here in Canada, we're more fortunate because we get allowed 7,000 becquerels per liter. Now, the thing about 7,000 becquerels, just imagine a liter of water, and there's 7,000 disintegrations going on every second, right? You drink that water, and those 7,000 disintegrations are going on inside your body. So uh, this is the standard in Canada, and recently, just last year in fact, the commissioners asked the, their staff, uh, because people like myself had goaded them into doing this actually, because we said that you're getting bad advice from your staff about tritium. So they asked the staff to explain how they ever arrived at 7,000 becquerels per liter, and the answer of the staff was is, we don't know. We, don't, we can't actually figure out what the logic was in arriving at that number. So now, that's why they had the one-day conference, and they're going to re-examine these, these safety standards. But let me tell you something. Fifteen years ago, this question was raised by activists in Ontario and by the Pickering uh, Town Council. Pickering, of course, being the community where the reactors are built. And they, they were concerned about the fact that there was tritium in their drinking water, and that every once in a while there was a big surge of tritium from the nuclear power plant because of an accidental spill. Because they try and keep that stuff inside, but you, you, you can't keep it forever, you know? Um, every once in a while they have an accident and you get 18,000 curies of tritium going into the environment at one shot. And of course, this would show up as a spike of tritium in the drinking water, but you know what? The community was never even informed that this was happening. So you never knew when the, tri when the water was particularly high in tritium. This is particularly concerning to people who might be individuals who may be pregnant because tritium is known to cross the placenta and to affect the fetus. They've done the animal experiments galore and they've shown that it causes a lot of uh, problems with animal fetuses. Presumably it would do the same with human fetuses. So that's, this is a concern and it's a concern that Albertans should be concerned about because uh, you know, back east, at least we have large bodies of water, like Lake Ontario. By the way, another thing is that even in the middle of Lake Ontario, they can measure that the tritium level is increasing year by year by small amounts. But they can measure a perceptible increase in tritium levels on a year by year basis, and it's almost entirely from the Canadian nuclear reactors. So here in Alberta, I think your, your water situation is a little bit more restricted. And uh, that would be more felt because, uh, you know, especially if you're going to build 14 of these things. So uh, that's something to bear in mind. Uh, now, here we have a gentleman. Uh, this is an ad. This is not Bob's photograph. <laughs> His photographs are black and white. Um, this is a gentleman, probably an actor. It's an ad from the Canadian Nuclear Association. It's called Small Wonder. And this gentleman is, it has in the desk in front of him uh, can-do fuel bundles, the fuel bundles that are used in a can-do reactor. Those bundles are generally filled with uranium, natural uranium pellets. And he's holding up one of those pellets and he's saying, look at that. This is one of the main attractions of nuclear power is that just one of these little pellets produces so much energy. And of course, that is truly astonishing. And it's the biggest attraction of nuclear power because it is such a concentrated form of energy. And uh, you think uh, it really is a small wonder. Um, but uh, what it doesn't explain in the ad is that if this man, if those fuel bundles were not fresh fuel bundles but used fuel bundles that had already gone through the reactor, he'd be dead. And the reason is because uh, the used fuel bundles are no longer just uranium. They are full of fission products. And the fission products uh, are so hot and so radioactive that a single fuel bundle will kill a human being in 20 seconds at a distance of one meter. Uh, the dose of radiation is incredible.